It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the movies of May 14th, 1999. We've got six movies to look at today, a lot of films to get to, so let's not waste any more time. Let's just go ahead and jump right on into it, and we'll start off with the biggest new release of the weekend, because honestly, a lot of the new releases this week were not that big, but this was the highest grossing of the ones, but that really isn't saying a whole lot. It's uh, Jet Li's follow-up to Lethal Weapon 4. They took one of his movies from Hong Kong, brought it to America, and thus we have Black Mask. The plot pretty much is very much the equivalent to something like Kill Bill. You have somebody who tried to get out, and then now the people that are coming that worked with him in the past are now coming back to come and kill him. And he's a super soldier, part of a super secret soldier project. And I was wondering why it looked like he was wearing some stuff from the Green Hornet, but it turns out that this film takes a lot of inspiration from the Green Hornet. Black Mask wears a domino mask of the show's first cap in the style of Kato, played by Bruce Lee in the series. And the Blast Mask is even compared to Cato in a news reporter scene. And um, uh, pretty much like I said before, Jet Li, this was his first movie after Lethal Weapon 4, kind of introduced him to the world, and um, uh, the, um, at least to American audiences. And this was their attempt to try to do what Jack, to Jackie Chan and Chow Yun Fat, try to bring them into the, into, the, into the American zeitgeist. And it did work in the end. Like, it was a film that, compared to some of the other American transfers that they've done of this film... This probably is the best one of the American re-edits they've done, because this one, yeah, it takes some stuff out of it, but it's not as distracting, it was not as insane as some of the other, some of the Jackie Chan versions that New Line Cinema did. Right that there's a hip-hop soundtrack to this, which really serves no purpose, but it's not distracting in any way, shape, or form. And some of the action sequences are here are very well done. I mean, Jet Li shows he has a lot of charisma. It shows a lot of acting of action potential. He really does show it in this movie. There's a lot of good action sequences. There's a lot of good setups. There's a lot of good storylines going on. It's a pretty enjoyable film. It's a fun little action film. I wouldn't say it's a classic by any means necessary, but it does a pretty good job of giving Jet Li a chance to show what he can do as a leading actor. And I think it pays off pretty well here. It's a well-made film. I'd say definitely check it out if you haven't seen it, but... Um, I wouldn't even say check this the American version out because it's not as bad as you would think it would be, especially considering that it it doesn't have a lot of the same flaws that the Jackie Chan New Line transfers did did when those came out. But um, this is still a really good film. I highly recommend checking it out. So um, let's go ahead and move on to the next movie, and that is William Shakespeare's A Midsummer's Night's Dream. I should say A Midsummer Night's Dream. I keep saying A Midsummer's Night's Dream, but it's not that. It's A Midsummer Night's Dream. And um, as I said before, it's based off of one of, of William William Shakespeare's most memorable plays. And you um, have a cast that includes Kevin Klein, Michelle Pfeiffer, Rupert Everett, Stanley Tucci, Callista Flockhart. You have Anna Friel, Christian Bale, Dominic West also in there. And um, it's pretty much the same story you know from the story of A Midsummer Night's Dream. It's a very ambitious, but at the same time, though, around this time, Hallmark was doing, like, a ton of different movies for, like, miniseries for NBC. Like, they did, like, um, Gulliver's Travels, and then there was another one they did around this time. I can't remember what it was, but it was, like, um, I can't remember what it was, but Alice in Wonderland. And there were times when I watched this trailer, and I thought to myself, you know, this really reminds me of something that you would see from a Hallmark NBC presentation, especially the Kevin Klein makeup job they do here, but... Uh, as far as the film itself goes, it's fine for what it is. I think there was a lot of higher ambitions to this film that I think they let on. I think there was an idea that this could be something more engaging and much more interesting. But at times, there are times in this movie that, like I said, it kind of feels too much like you're watching an NBC TV mi miniseries produced by Hallmark or, or something like that. And there's definitely times when it feels like that. Even this has kind of a similar budget to that, like $11 million is... Not too high for a movie like this, but it looks like it has much higher aspirations and more higher visual effects budgets to it, but it only costs $11 million, and if you can do that with $11 million, then you probably are doing something right, at least. Uh, this is directed and written by Michael Hoffman. We've talked about a couple of his movies in the past, uh, several really good films, Soap Dish, Restoration, One Fine Day, all solid films, and this is probably, like I said, the most ambitious one he's done yet, and I can see where they're definitely going with it. Do I think it worked all the way through? Not really, but the casting overall, I think, does carry it to another level, and it does feel like a faithful adaptation to Shakespeare's play of the same name. I mean, you have a strong cast overall here that makes this work. 
it's an ambitious film. It's a film that really took me by surprise. I really wasn't expecting a whole lot from it because I never really heard about it until I've I, actually I take that back. I heard about it, but um, I never I never really saw it in full before. And when I finally got to see it, I was actually really impressed by what I saw. I think it is a decent little film. Nothing too spectacular. Nothing too incredible. But I think it is something you should definitely check out. And by the way, you see like a white thing in my mouth. It's a piece of gum. So. Getting off of that altogether, but I um, wanted to make you wanted to let you know that I had a piece of gum in my mouth. So um, let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next movie to get away from this distraction. But um, next film, Trippin'. This really need to open up on a Wednesday. I mean, were you really that scared of st of Star Wars that much? You thought this movie, you thought this movie was actually going to be something, so you decided to push it a couple of days away from Star Wars, but um. I don't get it, but uh, you have a story here about this guy played by Dion Richmond. He's nearing the end of his high school days. His graduation slowly approaches. He's anxiously awaiting prom and has the hopes of going out with this girl, Cinny, the school's local beauty. And he tries to ask his parents to help him pay for prom. They begin nagging him after finding out he hadn't filled out one of his college applications, telling him that they won't give a dime until he fills one out along with those ones. He's an avid daydreamer and is always daydreaming or tripping, as they call it here, over everything. So it definitely feels like a little bit of an above pretty much a black version of Doug in a way, but Doug at least was at least trying to do something unique and different with its storyline. This just feels like, it doesn't feel like it really knows what exactly it wanted to be. Does it want to be like a sweet, a nice coming-of-age story? Or does it want to be a raunchy comedy for the sake of being a raunchy sex comedy? And it can't really find that balance that it really needs to make it really stick for itself. I mean, the acting overall really isn't all that impressive. I think the only person who really does show a lot of potential in this is Donald... It actually shows a lot of effort in this, I should say, is Donald Faison. This also is one of Anthony Anderson's earliest film roles, too. And, um... I don't know, man. I mean, I saw this a long, long time ago, so... I really don't know if it actually held up after all these years. But honestly, when I remember watching it, I remember really not liking it. And, um... I've really had no intentions of ever going back to it, quite honestly, so... Uh, probably not a good movie overall, as far as I remember. I remember it not being a good film, but if I, I'm pretty sure if I go back to it now, I'll probably be thinking the same thing, but, um, maybe not. Maybe I actually will find something about it, but, um, I don't know. As far as I remember, I don't remember liking this film so much, so that's just my, or that's just my remembrance of that film. So, on to the next movie, and that is Franco Zeffirelli's Tea with Mussolini. This was actually Zeffirelli's second-to-last film he did as a director. It tells the story of a young Italian boy's upbringing by a circle of British and American women before and during the Second World War. You see the names already in there. Cher, Judy Dench, Joan Plowright, Maggie Smith, uh, Lily Tomlin. Um, supposedly, this is based on a st based on his, uh, Franco Zeffirelli's life, because he, he is a semi-autobiographical dramedy, it says on Wikipedia's page. I've never seen the film, so I can't really say for certain if it's any good or not, but... You got some of the best actresses in the who are in the world. I mean, Cher, Judy Dench, Joan Plowright, Maggie Smith, Lily Tomlin. I mean, it's got to be worth it for ju just for that. I mean, probably not a great film that's going to be remembered as one of the great films of the year, but it's got to be worth it to get all those names in there at the still very much not not in between the the stretch of where they won Oscars to where they are now, just starring in w movies that are just basically aimed at older women and not have no real intentions of being good whatsoever, but. I mean, this could be something, but, um, again, I haven't seen it, so I can't really say too much about it, but, um, it was one of the big new releases this week, so I thought I'd bring it up, so, that's Tea with Mussolini, now let's go to a classic film that came out this weekend in a re-release, and that is Wallace Shawn and Andre Gregory in Louis Mao's My Dinner with Andre. The most fun you can spend watching two guys talking for two and a half hours, uh, talking about different things. You have fictionalized versions of Alice, Andre Gregory and Wallace Shawn. They're sharing a conversation at this restaurant in Manhattan. They cover different things such as experimental theater, the nature of theater, the nature of life, Andre's spiritual existence with Wally's modest humanism. And really, it's an engaging film. Like I know, like I said before... It's pretty much just these two just talking about different things, talking about different things in life like spirituality, near-death experiences, mid midlife crises, you know. It's something that a lot of people can relate to even by today's standards. And this was made back in 1981, over 40 years ago. 
And it's it was pretty much ahead of its time, really, because it's a fascinating film to watch. Like, it's really... You don't really expect a whole lot when you get in there, but as you watch the film and as you wa watch it go along, you get so invested in these conversations that these two guys have. Like, you really believe you're watching two friends watching the, them having this conversation, and it just really... It really is something special to see. It's a film that... I'm glad they re-released it then so a new generation can get to see what this kind of looked like on a big screen. It would have been interesting to see how this played out. And, you know, this is a film that really, like I said, is something that really was way ahead of its time. It's a film that has a lot of inspiration in the years since its release. You know, uh, Frasier did an episode in the first season pretty much covering this similar type of a situation. Like, it's basically Frasier and Niles in, a, in the coffee shop just talking, and they pretty much took the inspiration from that. Um, there is a, is, it has a lot of inspiration all around. Like, Animaniacs has had a lot of inspiration from it. The Simpsons had a lot of inspiration from it. Um, uh, there was a sh one of Pixar's earliest shorts, The Adventures of Andre and Wally B. The title was literally taken from this. Family Guys made references to it, so it's Community. Uh, a lot of people have taken, refer have taken inspiration and references from this movie, and rightfully so, because it is a very fascinating film. You never really would expect that two people sitting in a restaurant would be this engaging and this enticing and this en enjoyable to watch, but I'll be damned if it is. It's a film that I think a lot of people really should give a chance, and I am glad to see that over 40 years later, its legacy has continued to live on after all these years. It's a really great film. I highly recommend checking it out if you haven't seen it already. My Dinner with Andre, fantastic, fantastic film. Our last movie is not so much. It's um, the underground comedy movie. Now, if you grew up watching Comedy Central after midnight in the late in the early 2000s, you probably saw a commercial that looked exactly like this. I think that pretty much sums up everything you need to know about this movie. If you're one of your biggest stars is Joey Buttafuoco, then clearly you're not you're not in for a lot of entertainment value here. I mean, if one of the selling points is watch these two supermodels go into the bathroom, it's just like, okay, like really you're pushing that guy. And uh, this is Vince Offer. Vince Offer, of course, is the sham wow guy. And basically, you have a story here where it consists of skits featuring celebrities in various roles based on concepts offered and originally performed on a public access television show he had hosted. Stuff like G. Lee Nolan, Nolan posing as Marilyn Monroe, supermodels loudly using the restroom, a uh, superhero named Dick Man who dresses in a penis costume and defeats his enemies, lesbians, by squirting them with semen. I mean, there's literally things that are called like Batman and Boob Watch, Virgin Hunter, Gay Virgin, I Hate L.A., The Godmother, The Adventures of Dick Man. Um, a porno review uh, Donna of the Dead is one of the other ones they mentioned here and it's just kind of like like the trail the commercials pretty much tell you everything you need to know about this movie and um, like what more do I even need to say about it it's a film that is trying to be a new Kentucky Fine movie but Kentucky Fine movie is still really damn funny almost 50 years after its release because it doesn't was it like that movie was at least trying, and when it did gross out humor, it was much smarter. It was much more clever. When it tried to ha when it tried to add sex into it, it was put in pl very well, and it didn't f feel like it was being forced in there to get the to get like twenty year olds to watch this film. This film is literally just that. It's a tasteless film. It's a ridiculous movie that just has absolutely nothing of value to it whatsoever. And guess what, kiddies? Not, it's almost 15 years later, this dude made a sequel that was literally the exact same thing, in, inappropriate comedy. You probably have never heard of it because you were probably so distracted by movie 43 to forget that this same thing came out around the exact same time. It's literally the same thing, the underground comedy movie, except, hey, we got bigger names this time. Instead of Michael Clark Duncan and J Joey Buttafuoco, we got Lindsay Lohan because Lindsay Lohan will still be a... A respectable actress in 2013. We got Michelle Rodriguez. We got Rob Schneider. We've got an Academy Award winner in Ro in Adrian Brody, basically doing the same thing he did, they say the same skit they did in the previous film, and his whole segment is nothing but homoerotic double entendres, and just like you can't believe that somebody like Adrian Brody was saw this and said, "Yeah, I'll be willing to do this," like. It's literally the same thing from the other movie, they, except, like, they wanted to go more offensive, they wanted to be more insane with it, and, uh, shockingly, it's even worse than the underground comedy movie, which is, like, I mean, just, wow, this guy has no taste whatsoever, and, like, I don't get it, man, I just don't get it with this guy, like, like, 
two movies he's made of the exact same thing, and both are absolutely horrible. And he's tried to sue people, and he's lost those cases. Like he was, he filed a suit against the against the Fairley brothers because they claimed that 14 scenes from There's Something About Mary were lifted from his film. And the Fairley brothers basically come out and said, we've never heard of him, we never heard of this movie, and the case was basically dismissed on a pre on prejudice of a motion for summary judgment. And um, and he kept suing people. He actually successfully sued Anna Nicole Smith for $4 million, claiming that she, had to, she appeared to be in the movie but backed out over fears that the movie would be detrimental to her career because, I mean... This movie is going to be detrimental to your career, really. Like, like it's just, it's ridiculous. It's one of the most bizarre, insanely bad movies you'll ever see. I mean, that trailer alone pretty much should tell you to stay the hell away from the underground comedy movie. And thankfully, a lot of people did, but that didn't stop him from becoming a success with the Sham Wow. And I guess he used that money to make the sequel that makes absolutely no sense. It was just a re literal repeat of the movie he just did beforehand. It's just like... I mean, what more do you got to say, man? The underground comedy movie, it is, um, it's every bit as bad as you think it is. I will give you that. And on that pleasant note, we wrap up another edition of the Time About the Movies. Uh, next week, we will head into Memorial Day weekend. And, of course, that's where the big summer movie season launches with the biggest blockbuster of the year. And there's a film that comes out. It's um, about a phantom menace. It's episode one of a specific series. Uh, Wars of Stars, I think it's called. Um... I'm just sticking with you here. Uh, we'll look at Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace, which um, has, a, has had an interesting history. If you are not too familiar with how the initial reaction to this film came out, wait until you see the next, next, next time we meet, because we'll delve into that. And we have movies that actually had the balls to go up against it, including Janine Garofalo in The Love Letter. Uh, that was one of the movies that came, that came out the exact same weekend. We also have another movie based off of a sci-fi sci franchise, the documentary Trekkies. And uh, that's pretty much it, those three films. So we'll look at Phantom Menace, Love Letter, and Trekkies on the next episode. Uh, but until then, thank you very much for watching. And if you want to see more videos like this, please hit the plays on the next page. Check out the previous episode. And I'll see you guys tomorrow for another episode. So thanks for watching. Oh, and also don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this on this channel. So I'll see you guys tomorrow for another video. So with that said, I'm off. See you next time. And until then, as always, take care.